All right, everybody. How we doing? I'll fix that. <laughs> Guys, come on up, have a seat. Yeah, how we doing? I'm Greg. Lindsay, nice to see you. TJ, good to see you, buddy. Yeah, thanks for coming. How are you, sir? I'm Greg. Hi, Dave. Nice to see you. Greg? Ah, I'll see if I can remember that one. Dean? Gene. Gene. Okay, Gene. Yeah, nice to have you here. How are you, sir? Hi, Dave. Good to see you. Uh, folks in the back, hey. <laughs> uh, guys, what I'm going to do uh, right now is that I get asked, you know, when people kind of hear about the type of things that we're doing and the program that we've built, I realize that I'm not the only one out there that, you know, has connected the dots and has seen ways that we can teach kids more than kind of what we've been teaching them. It's like that old adage, you know, you kind of keep doing what you've been doing and you keep getting what you've been getting kind of a thing. And one of the things that happened um, in 2008 is that I had a friend of mine who uh, was going through, he was starting his ground school. And this was a guy who had some charter schools. And he said, Greg, you fly, you're a pilot. He says, you know, the stuff that I'm learning in ground school, I'm learning algebra, trigonometry, earth science, physics, physical fitness, virtually everything that we teach in our schools all seems to kind of point toward this airplane here. And he says, it seems like there would be a way to introduce these concepts from aviation to kids to show the application of the math and the science that they're learning in the classrooms. Because when you're able to do that, now you introduce relevance. And it's that relevance piece that allows us really to move the needle. And he said, what would you do with something like that? And I said, well, you know, I, I don't know. Let me think about it for a while and I'll send you a note. So a couple weeks later, I sent him an email. <clears throat> it was about three pages long. Hit send, heading out to the airport, ironically enough. I get a phone call. And he said, hey, I got your email. I said, yeah, what'd you think? He says, got a question for you. When can you start? I'm like, whoa, hang on, Neg negative, Ghost Rider. My pattern is full. It's like, you know, that's not what I was doing. I had no intention of, you know, this being kind of a me thing. It was just like, this is what I can see happen. I have a degree in K through 12 education. And so it's like that thing that I see, here's where things could work out. <laughs> and, and that three page email actually became the backbone of the program that we have built. Uh, I'll kind of run you through this little dog and pony show here that might, you know, kind of answer some questions that you guys may have. And I'll try to do it with a little pace so that it leaves us some time here at the end for questions and answers. If, if, if you have any questions, and we'll see if I have any answers. But uh, we'll kind of run through this. Can you guys see this okay? Because uh, I'll, I'll just use this and I won't necessarily split the screen here if you guys can kind of see that there if that works for you uh, What I'll kind of be talking about here this by the way is a presentation that uh, That I developed for school districts for, for them to kind of see and again not necessarily knowing the type of background that people that were going to be seeing this there's some of this that's relatively you guys have already got this. But to some, it may be the first time that they have really thought about it. So this is kind of the reason that I bring this up. Uh, one of the things, uh, and again, I'm just gonna kind of work through this, and so again, if my pace is too quick here, just tell me to slow down and I will. <clears throat> How long have we been talking about more math and science in the schools? We're talking about this because it came really in 1983, Gardner et al. in the Reagan administration published a paper called Nation at Risk. And it says, guess what guys? We are really behind other countries when it comes to what our students are, are, are producing with regards to scoring math and science. We're way behind. And that was kind of the alarm. 
Since then, every single administration has had the answer. Here's the call to arms. Here's how we do it. Here's how we do all of this other stuff. With everything basically geared toward increasing test scores. Well, my thing was, is like, okay, so a kid goes from a 75 to a 90 on a math test. Now, is that gonna make him want to be an engineer? Well, not necessarily. And that's the thing, is to say, to what end? Why are we doing this? What's the ultimate goal that we have here? And that's always been a question to me, is to say, you know, you know, the, the, the flogging will continue until morale improves, kind of a thing. It's like, you can say that we're gonna change, but if you keep doing things the same way, what really have we changed? <clears throat> the need is for higher tech employees here. I don't have to tell you about the number of companies that in this country that have gone elsewhere, moved their manufacturing facilities to where the skill is. It's not rocket surgery. I mean, that's kind of where they're gonna go. If you cannot find people locally to work in your facility, you're gonna go find them somewhere. That's, that's how your business survives. That's how you grow. I have a friend of mine, John Yuzakai at Aspen Avionics, and he was telling me this early on about having to go to Singapore to a job fair to try to find the right skilled people to work in his shop. And I'm like going, you're kidding me. He goes, Greg, we're not growing them. We're not doing them. We are not interesting kids into our field. We're not, they don't have that interest. Some of them don't even know it exists. <clears throat> On top of that, somebody tells me, we may be looking at a pilot shortage. We've only been hearing that since how long? Well, guess what? They're parking airplanes. They're parking the regionals. They're snatching up those people out of there to fly the heavy metal. Now we're parking regional airplanes. We do not have enough pilots to fly these airplanes. And we've been saying this forever. Those of you that have listened to Kit Darby for a long time, I've been listening to him forever. He's kind of been the one ringing the bell, you know, for a long time saying, guys, we're gonna have a problem. And then even with me going to like that first EAA meeting and I walk in there and I'm looking around and I'm thinking, wait a minute, I'm the youngest guy in the room here. Guys, we need to be thinking, you know, a little bit less about what we might be wanting to take to Oshkosh and thinking about, is there gonna be an Oshkosh at some point? To say, because if we're not bringing kids into this mix, what are we doing? Well, then if we bring kids into the mix, how do you do it? Do you do it with a discovery flight? I know that that changed it for me. That's what I wanted to do. But then again, where's the pathway? Where's the pathway for success for that kid, once they've gotten that taste, Candyland, they're ready, they want more. How do we get them to the finish line? What do we do? We look here at the skills gap. In the STEM field, STEM is the big word that, you know, our program was not designed to be a STEM program. It just happens to be that what we do is STEM. Everything we do is about science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. I could be up here on a chalkboard or a dry erase board, but you'll notice that if I am going to teach technology, I'd better be able to demonstrate technology because kids see through that in a heartbeat. What do we do about increasing our awareness of the world around us? We call that technological literacy. What are we doing to increase that? When you look at aeronautics, Aeronautics being the study of the science of flight. When you look at aeronautics, I know I don't have to tell anybody in this tent about, okay, we get it. It is STEM. It is that. It just, we're not that word. It just happens to be that what we do is that word. It's innovative. The kids, it's different. It's not the same thing that we've been doing for X number of years. It's creative, I guess. I, you know, I just think of what we do as kind of being relatively natural and sort of following that same progression, but a lot of people say it's creative. Okay. Engaging. You know, the kids eat this up. It's, you know, it's just nuts. They really do, and they really respond to this, and they really want more. It's not, it's, it's not the big bald man, trust me. It's, it's, it's the subject matter. 
It's the opportunities that these kids get. We talk about 21st century learning. What is that? What is 21st century learning? To each person here, it's probably going to be something different. But supposedly, what 21st century learning is, is first of all, learning how you learn. Everyone learns differently. Everybody has, has different ways that they assimilate information in some useful fashion. The reason that this is a big deal is because of how quickly things are changing in our world. So creating 21st century learners. So for example, when you look at what it is that we do, what do you have to learn and demonstrate to be a pilot? Now again, remember, I show this information to school districts because again, the, the number of pilots per se or people with aeronautics experience in there, it's not a real high percentage, but there are some that do certainly. Look at everything here. Think of your classrooms. Think of your schools. This kind of look like your catalog, your course catalog, your curriculum that you have out there. All of this is what you do when you, when you learn to become a pilot. And just, just, just the ground school portion of this. It's everything we teach in schools. Critical thinking. Standing on your own two feet. Problem solving. Being able to do it in a crisis. Being able to do it when the chips are down. Huge. Artistry. How many of you have ever enjoy music? How many music majors do we have here? You get that, that instrument ticket? Isn't that, honest to God, like being in an orchestra? You've got all these things going on around you, and you have to be able to pull that information in and play your part. That's what we do in instrument flight. Everything we do. Notice the one thing here? Well, I'll tell you this here in a second. Communications. It's the huge one. I start these kiddos on these machines in the fourth grade. We get some kids that got some skills. They can flog that airplane around this simulator probably better than I can. Here's where the wheels fall off. That's where I put that headset on. Okay, now you got to talk. What? Oh, yeah. Not only that, you got to listen. What's more important? Talking, listening, listening, talking. What's more important? Well, it's listening, active listening teaching them what active listening really, really is. Think about that as a life skill. If I could wave my little magic aeronautic wand out there, that's the gift I would give everyone. The gift of becoming a better listener, more so than just, you know, jibber jabber with that. What is the one thing that our, that our DPEs tell us when they're giving check rides to young people? Greg, kid could fly the ailerons off the thing. He could do things with an airplane I can't do but I don't know what he knows. I can't get him to talk to me. Sound familiar? We start the verbal communications here so that we can go here instead of here. It's the one thing that when I take these kids to college campuses, we talk to professors. We talk to department heads every single place we go. And I always ask the same question. What can I do to help prepare these kids for someone like you? And you know the number one thing they tell me? Send me a kid who can walk into my classroom with their head up as opposed to their head down. Send me a kid that can look me in the eye when they talk to me. Send me a kid that can write a report I can read. Everything they ask of me has to do with communications. And the one thing we really haven't talked about here yet, it's actually flying the airplane. I haven't even talked about flying the airplane yet. This is just what you have to learn. When you go through one of my classes, you're going to learn how you learn. My go-to class in high school, because I teach the FAA courses for, for private instrument and commercial. This last spring, I had six kids in my commercial class. <clears throat> We teach the integrated private and instrument course. And the reason that we do that, we make it a year-long course, two semesters. 
And the reason that we combine those like that is because there's about a 28% overlap of information between the two books. And when you kind of pull that together right there, it makes it a little bit more from a time management standpoint for these kids, makes it kind of easier for them to sort of get through. Plus now what's happened is that schools, not all schools, have gone from an eight period to a seven period day. And so when that happened is they lost a slot that they could take another class. Well, by combining those two together then, I'm not, I don't say competing, but the kids aren't having to choose then between something else that they may take, even though that they want to take this, but the counselor is saying, look, in order for you to do this, 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 you got to take this. So I get that, because the classes that I teach are elective classes, and I want them to be elective, and I'll tell you about that here in a minute. But when you go through that volume, and the first thing that I do is I, I you know, as the first day of class, is I, in essence, I try to talk them out of, out of the class, is to say, you guys have got to understand this class will probably be the most demanding class that you're going to take in your high school career. It's why you get college credit for this class. It's because it's hard. Okay? This is what you do. Then I start stacking up the textbooks. Then all of a sudden the eyes get big. How many of you like to read? <laughs> well, get ready. Here it comes. And so we start talking about that. But then we talk about the payoff. We talk about the alliances that we have post-secondary. We talk about the opportunities for them. This is it. It's going to be hard, but it's going to be worth it. And we, we talk about all of that. But as they go through those volumes of information that they have, there's 809 pages in the textbook that I use. To go through that in, in two semesters, just that book, I'm not even talking about the, the FARs, not even talking about all the other books that go along with it, for you to digest this, you're going to have to learn how you learn. You're going to have to become a good technical reader, because this is technical reading. You're going to have to understand what that is. It takes them about three to four weeks of reading to be able to flip that switch, to go from the pleasure style of reading to technical reading. So you learn. Are you visual? Are you auditory? Touch and feel. You have to do this. I'm a big believer in experiential education. Let's go out there, let's do it. I don't want to talk about it, let's show you how to do it. I try to eliminate theory every chance I get. The reason that we do this is because this generation, these kids who are going through our classes right now, the kids that we're training for careers that haven't even been invented yet, what we're doing is we're teaching them how to learn because they're gonna change careers in their lifetimes more than I change jobs. That's just the way of it. So if you don't know how you learn, if you don't know how you can assimilate information quickly and efficiently and effectively, you're gonna be left behind. And this is one of the courses that starts bringing all that together. The way that we built this program, the program that we have right now is K through 12. The original vision of this program is K through 16. More on that later. We've developed two STEM industry certification pathways for this, this program. We have one on the engineering side, we have one on the pilot side. On the engineering side, we start kids building airplanes in the third grade. In addition to them building static models in the third and fourth grade, they learn procedure, they learn teamwork, they learn critical thinking, they learn problem solving. Because here's what happens, Mr. R, Mr. R, I need help, I need help. Okay, Sally, let me ask you a question. What would you do right now if I weren't here? Uh, you got a partner right here. Ask your partner, what do you think right here? Let's figure it out. Let's figure this out. This big piece of paper that you got over here, Johnny, do you know what that is? We call those instructions. Let's look at those. We allow kids to fail. There's no spoon feeding in our program. We will allow them to fail. We will let them learn what it's like to pick themselves up out of the dirt, dust themselves off, get back on the horse and say, where'd I screw this up? How do I fix it? That's a big part of our program. With this, on, on the engineering side, again, if we start building airplanes in the third grade, that runs all the way up to the UAV program that we have in the middle school. So fifth through eighth, we do UAVs, UASs. In high school, we build real live airplanes. All of the things that these kids start hearing in the third grade, all of the procedures, all of the verbiage, 
continues all the way up through in through high school with this. So from that, we're implementing A and P certification with these kids going up through this program. So there's one industry certification. On the pilot side, as they learn how to fly, we start these kids on these machines in fourth grade. This is where we start. Fourth grade, we start getting them on the sims. We start integrating those with their math and science and social studies and pick a class and saw the list. There's a ton of things that we can do with these machines that engage these kids at a level that it's hard to do. We start in the fourth grade with that. Our kids have the opportunity to graduate high school as multi-engine commercial pilots. That's what we do. We start them coming out of high school as multi-engine commercial pilots. We're now four years ahead of the curve. That's where we are. All of the courses are curricular. One of the things that first started here is to say these are not extracurricular things. These kids are going to be working too hard. They got to get credit for these classes. If they get college credit for these classes, you better darn well be able to give them high school credit for it. <clears throat> Aircraft building and maintenance, career and college readiness we talked about. We do internships, the dual enrollment opportunities that we talked about with the colleges. We really don't need articulation agreements because the federal government has figured that out already. When those kids show up at that university that has those aviation programs, they show up with that picture of Orville and Wilbur on that piece of plastic, they get credit for those classes that they have. And it depends on the university as to how much credit they get for each. X number of credits for the ground school, X number of credits for the lab, that a lot of them call it, which is the flying piece. More on some of the, the, the really cool thing that I'll tell you here at the end with regard to this dual enrollment thing. Um, when we look at this, these are the wings. Even though that, that as you saw earlier, the Aspen Aerospace Alliance, I'm the founder and the CEO of that company. It's a nonprofit company. The program itself, the part that belongs to the kids, has the wings. That belongs to them. Everything that they do goes up through that program. They don't care about the nonprofit status of a company. They don't care about how we do what we do. What, what their thing is here is that pathway. That's what those wings represent. They represent the pathway for those kids. The nomenclature here, aeronautics engineering research opportunities. That's what aero means to us. I don't have to tell you how kids respond to airplanes. If, if you want to know, just walk out there and just watch these kids walking around today looking at these airplanes. They're kind of like I am, giddy. They love it. They're hooked on those wings. So what we do is, we kind of hook them with the wings, we clean them and fry them over here on the engineering side of the things. So that's kind of our thing. Life skills, critical thinking. We teach kids, hopefully, how to not just be engineers and pilots. I want you to be a better member of this society. I want you to understand what it's like to fail, to figure it out, and to succeed. These are the four core values of our program. This is the backbone of everything we do. Commitment, perseverance, respect, honor. You've got to commit to something. When you commit to something, the discipline will follow. That's one of the things that I hear. You've got to be more disciplined, Johnny. Well, the reason that it looks like Johnny may not be as disciplined is because Johnny's not committed. Once Johnny is committed, he or she will do that which is necessary to achieve a goal. You commit, you persevere. This is not easy. You're going to fail. It's going to hurt. But you're going to pick yourself up. You're going to learn grit. That's what you're going to learn here. You're going to learn how to look at the hard times and saying, OK, I've seen this before. I can get through it. You've got to stay with it. Respect. Number one, it begins with me. When those kids come through a classroom, I don't know how many classroom teachers I have here. How many times have you opened that door for that thing? And here come these kids. Here they come. Here they come. They walk into my classroom and they walk over something called the threshold of communications. They walk in, the first thing they do, they lock eyes on me. Good morning, Mr. R. How are you? Good morning, Johnny. Great to see you. Thank you very much. Appreciate you asking. That happens in my room. There's no shuffling in. It is the threshold of communications. This is where it begins. This is where the interaction begins right here. And on that way out as they cross, thank you, Mr. R. Good afternoon, Mr. R. See you, Mr. R. I demand it. And ultimately, they are better for it. That's just one thing. They start with respect for themselves. 
with respect for the process, respect for me, they get respect for others, respect for this aircraft, respect for the things that they're doing out there, respect for each other, and then honor. They're going to learn what honor is all about. Where did this program come from? Is this an entitlement? Is this something that just now, well, of course, you know, of course we're going to get to do this. Nope. A lot of people have done a lot of things to give you this opportunity here. And here's how you honor them. Here's how you turn that into a verb. You do better. You get better. You see what they did, you do it better. That's what they expect. It's what I expect. And you honor me by doing that. And that's, that's part of the things that they learn. That's at the core of everything we do. I realize that to some that may sound, I don't know how it sounds, but in my experience, it's something we're missing. What we have done is that we have created three nonprofit corporations to support the program. Remember, this is the program. This is the pathway. In order for that pathway to be supported, to create a pathway for success, we built three companies. The Aspen Aerospace Alliance, the Aspen Higher Learning Flight Academy, and the Aspen AeroBuild Corporation. All three of those are nonprofit companies. And one of these days, if you want to ask me about, about creating a, uh, a nonprofit aircraft rental company, getting that through the IRS, <laughs> buy me a beer and I'll tell you about that one. But it, it ultimately was, it just took them a while to understand. What, what it is that we're after here and why we exist. And once they were able to understand that, it was like, oh wow, okay, all right. But it just took a while to get there. But these are the three companies that support the pathways, engineering and pilots. Aerospace Alliance, 501c3, our mission is to bring the benefits of an aeronautical education to K through 12 students in Colorado and beyond. That's our, that's our program. This program was designed to be scalable. It was designed to be plugged into the existing curricular architecture of public schools everywhere. I started in charter schools. I wrote the charter for SAMS Academy, Southwest Aeronautics, Mathematics, and Science Academy in Albuquerque. I think you all know that I'm not necessarily splitting the atom up here. That type of thing is not, is not the hardest thing to do. You just have to you know, want to, to do it and get it done but I wanted to cast a wider net. I wanted to bring these opportunities to more kids, to more kids in more areas that needed this, that needed these opportunities. Our whole thing is about tools and opportunities. I'm not a big uh, uh, prescriber, subscriber I should say. I'm not a big subscriber to the notion that, all right, here you are. You're a sophomore in high school, here's what you're capable of. Here you are. You're a freshman in high school, here's all you can do. Here you are, you're in fifth grade, this is all you can do. My philosophy is, let's get the tools and opportunities for these kids, and let's let them show us what they can do. A lot of times, you know, as, as I think it was Michelangelo who said something to the effect of, the greater risk for most of us is not setting our mark and, and, and undershooting, but it's setting it too low and hitting the mark. Or as we would say out in West Texas, better to shoot for the moon and miss than it is to aim for the ditch and hit, you know? Let's think about where we're putting the bar. Let's think about where it is. And I tell school districts this as well, and I say, you're looking at this and thinking, well, you know, there's moving parts, et cetera, and implementing this and everything else. And I say, that's not the hard part. The hard part is staying ahead of this ball once you get it rolling, because these kids are gonna go nuts once you start this. And that's kind of what happens. Um, we support the local educators here. I'm not there to replace a math teacher. I'm not there to replace a science teacher. I'm there to work with those teachers. I'm there to work with them, to team with them. Tell me what you need help with. Tell me what it is in your classroom that you need that little extra edge, that little different kind of a viewpoint. And let me show you what we do over here in my side of the house. We team with those. And we do a lot of team teaching with that as well. So we partner with them. Uh, when, we, when I wrote that charter for Southwest Aeronautics, Mathematics, and Science Academy, looking at, at STEM education, one of the things that, that really, to me, kind of 
you know, what rung my bell was this integrative STEM philosophy is so that you don't have necessarily a program like this that exists in a silo somewhere in a school. It's interdisciplinary. It's where you integrate the STEM philosophy throughout disciplines, throughout everything, through math, through science, through history, through communications, through art. And we bring it all together for a common goal, to keep kids on a path. And that's one of the things, too, that we, that we work to try to create. I also, I have adults in my classes. I teach adult classes. And the reason being is because once you start this, adults come out of the woodwork and say, well, well I want to do it. You know, I want to play. You got anything for me? And it's awesome. Because what we do is we create then that, that type of connection with the community that we might not otherwise have. Because after all, as I said before, what's the end game? What is it that we're doing? If we're not thinking about the J-O-B at the end of this deal, why am I here? So what is it that your community needs? Do you have a factory or someplace out here that needs skilled people? Well then yes. Do you have some kind of flight piece around you here that needs pilots? Well, yes. Let us help fill those slots for you. Let us help you in your community. Help us do this. It's not a one-guy deal. And then the Aero Educator Network, that's the piece that allows us to share what we do. This is an example of my classroom that I have in Aspen. You can see that, that we embrace technology. This is kind of what we do here as well. Uh, all of the boards are all touch screen. They all capture everything that we do. Even though at the end of these things, I can hit a button at the end and I can, I can you know, capture everything that I have drawn with the notes of that day in a PDF and email them to the kids, I seldom do that. Because if I, if I do that and I print that off or if I send them that email, I own it. That's mine. But if you sit there and you take the notes and you draw it, and you connect the dots. Now you own it. Now it has more meaning. So I, I don't do that a whole lot. This is my classroom, kind of a panorama. And I realize that sometimes people sit here and they nod and they go, mm, okay, all right. You have an FMX in the corner of your classroom. Okay, great. <laughs> it was the first thing that I went out there and started knocking on doors for. I had seen these before. Uh, and it was like, this can be the cornerstone of everything that we do. Because not only can this machine be used for flight training, but here's how I use it. Everything that I do inside that machine gets pumped out through Insight. Insight is the program that then sends the video out of everything that we do. So for instance, on this screen, I have ForeFlight. I have everything that we have here with regard to the telemetry of that flight gives us everything that we need here. The center screen, it's the wind screen with the cockpit. What do I see? And on this screen is an in-cockpit cam because each one of these lessons that I do with kids, I take a kid in here with me. We have headsets, I have speakers, and I talk to the kids out here while I'm in there and they can see me inside the machine. So here's an example of what we can do. Math teacher comes to me and says, Greg, what do you got on ratios? This is the way these conversations come at the school now. Greg, what do you got on, Greg, what do you have on this? I have one come to me and says, what do you have on ratios? I said, I got some, bring them in. Kids come in and I think it was a seventh grade class. And we were talking about ratios. What is a ratio? How do we use it? Well, let me show you how we use ratios in my world. Here we are in our Diamond DA-40. Those are the aircraft that we have. We're in a Diamond DA-40. I'm. I'm 13 nautical miles east of Vail. I'm at 13,000 feet. Then all of a sudden, things get quiet. The engine quits. What do I do? What do I do? Uh, uh, crash? No. Crashing? That's bad form and we shan't have it. What do we do? Well, could you land somewhere? I will definitely land somewhere. Yes, that's going to happen. Gravity always wins. Where am I going to land? In a road, in a field, in a blah, blah, blah. And I said, how about this? How about in an airport? Oh, well, that's too far. Really? Let's talk about ratios. Diamond DA-40 has a glide ratio of 13 to 1. What does that mean? For every 1,000 feet of altitude that it loses, it'll go forward 13,000 feet. 
Let's do some math. So we do the math about where we are, how much altitude that we have to use. We do it no wind because, again, it's just you know, some variables here. You, for classroom demonstration purposes, you kind of want to watch. And then we have them work in teams. They work out the problem. Yes, you can. No, you can't. Those are the teams. Come on, Johnny. Let's go. We hop in the airplane. We fly it. I get 13 nautical miles east of Vail, 13,000 feet, kill the engine. What do I do? Initially, pitch for 73. Point that thing to an airport, off we go. Here's our communications, here's this, here's that, they hear me do it all. And then for the next seven minutes and 30 seconds, they watch this airplane glide and we land at the airfield in Vail. Now again, I test these. <laughs> I, I make this kind of control to make sure that, you know, we're, we're, where we are. But that ratio works. It, the algorithms of the physics of that, of that software works. And so then we talk about how did we do it? How do we know? How did I know that I could make that? Because I was able to do that quick math to know because I'm always doing that quick math in my head as I fly to say, where can I put this airplane? That's how we show kids what ratios are about. And that's one example of things that we do so that we can actually do it this way. Do I need the FMX to be able to make that demonstration? I could do it with the jig. But in order for this machine to, to be a multi-purpose machine, not just for the flight instruction for my students, but also from a revenue generator from the local pilot community that wants to come in here and use this machine for what I believe these folks at Redbird and God have made this thing for, which is instrument training. It is one of the best instrument trainers ever. We can do things in that airplane that we can't do in the regular airplane. Do you go out there and do you teach spins anymore? Well, no, can't do that anymore. Most aircraft aren't even certified for spins. But we can. We can put that kid in that airplane and we can get them spring-loaded to respond appropriately in an emergency. We put them in situations there in my classroom that we would never put a student in, but we learn. So that's one way that I use these. Also in the back, this picture was taken when I had four of the J's. I have 13 of them now in my classroom. We use those in almost every single class that I teach. These are some of my kids in here. This is uh, that's a high school class uh, that's in there. You can see here, uh, this is a, a middle school class that we have. These are some kids doing some flight planning in middle school here for one of the flights that they're doing on the J. Uh, these are a group of fourth graders. They're using E6Bs. We're doing time, speed, and distance problems. We're doing a little class that I call, which way, how far, how long? We teach the kids to use things like E6B flight computers. And you hold this up and they go, wait a minute, Mr. Arnold's not a computer. So why isn't it a computer? Where do you plug it in? Where are the batteries? Where's the screen? All computers have to have electronics? Oh, OK. So you're depending on electrons to bounce around in there, right? So what do you do in that airplane when your iPad turns off? What do you do when all that gee whiz stuff in the front of your airplane now is dark? What do you got? Number one, you got your supercomputer. Second of all, you've got something here that don't need batteries. We're gonna teach you how to do it the Ozark way. I teach these kids how to do it with a compass, a pencil, and a stopwatch. And I tell these kids, I say, okay, I'm gonna teach you all how to do it the Ozark way, then I'll show you how to do it the Buck Rogers way. Well, the first time I said that, I had, you know, crickets, Buck Rogers, what? Right? I'm like, Luke Skywalker? Eh. One kid said, Tony Stark? Okay, all right, we'll take that. We'll take that. So that's what we do. Because again, if these kids don't understand the underlying math and science of the calculations that we're going to force them to make here with this airplane, are you just going to blindly accept the numbers that show up here on something where you're just pushing buttons? Is that what you're going to do? I'm pilot in command. When I do that, I'm no longer in command. This is iPad in command, okay? I don't wanna say I have control issues. I'm more of a control enthusiast, I think. I like to be able to control the outcome. That's what we do, and that's what you get to do when you learn to do it this way. Higher Learning Flight Academy, nonprofit, rental, company. We went out, knocked on doors. We have two Diamond DA-40s. 
We had a Seneca. Uh, we had a Piper Seneca. We're now shopping for a, a different aircraft. Had some maintenance issues uh, with our Piper Seneca. So we're looking at a different twin to get back in the stable. But this is what we did. We created a nonprofit rental company. These students that go through the ground school can go over here to the Aspen Higher Learning Flight Academy and rent these aircraft. We have a subsidy for the kids. Kids rent these aircraft at a wet rental of 125 bucks an hour. The adults that are part of my program, they rent it at 185 an hour. That $60 differential in there pays for the maintenance, pays for the fuel, keeps these things going. And that's part of the reason that we also bring the community in here as well. So that's how we do that with these. These are some of the kids doing the deal there. This is Grace. She's, she is a success story in and of itself. Uh, Anthony Rios, he was out there on his first flight. This is one of our airplanes. Not a bad place to fly it, right? Kind of cool. Again, if you're going to teach technology, you, you should teach technology. Could we have done steam gauges? Yeah. But that was my work. That's not their work. This is their work. This is why everything we do is G1000. In our FMX, we have three plugins. We've got a, a Diamond DA40, G1000, GFC700, exactly like our training aircraft. Control loading stick, everything. We have a 182 RG with steam gauges and a 430 stack. Then we have, for multi, we have a Baron BE58 with the G1000 GFC700. So those are the three that we have right now. We're actually looking to put a Cirrus uh, SR-22 in there. It's going to be our next one, hopefully. But that's what we have. Because again, if you're going to preach it, you better teach it. This is uh, some flying with one of the kids up there in Aspen. Uh, this is us coming in here, runway 33. Here we are coming in. Zach is uh, putting the whammy to it. You'll notice here that we also use cameras in here. We have three cameras that we run on our flights so that they can record the flight lessons. Some, some instructors balk at that, but it's like, well, now, wait a minute. We have this technology. How do we use it to our benefit? Instead of now just saying, hey, Johnny, remember that radio call you missed 10 minutes into the flight? <laughs> Heck no, Johnny doesn't remember that. They're in sensory overload. They don't remember landing, you know? And so now, you go back and you play the flight. Johnny hears it, like, oh gosh, yeah, that's it. And to actually see why that left wing dipped when they started in there with that steep turn because they didn't roll in a little power. Now they can see it. So we use these cameras. My centerline discipline is awesome. Our classroom again. This is something that we have done for the last three years. So people ask me, what do I do with these machines? We teach them math and science on the machines. We teach them how to fly different things. We teach them how to do flight planning. We teach them real world scenarios. And we make them prove it in our round the world flight challenges. We've done three of these now. I come up with a course, I come up with an airplane. The first one the kids did in a King Air, second one they did in an Embraer, uh, a Phenom 300. This last one they did in a Boeing 314B. You guys know what that is? Clipper ships. The year, 1941. The date, December 6th. They're departing San Francisco Bay, heading west. We plug diversions into these things to kind of make them realistic. Can you imagine what the diversion was in that one? This is what we do. This is what we have the technology to be able to do. These kids fly this real time. They are in that classroom for 48 hours. Not all of them, but they work in two crew shifts. Uh, Two-hour uh, shifts, crews are pilot, first officer, captain, first officer. Every 30 minutes they switch. They fly for two hours total. Then they switch. They go around the clock. And that's what they do with these, with these flight challenges. And, and they go nuts. Our friends at Four Flight were able to go ahead and pop this in to kind of show where we are with these aircraft. These are the kids coming in here to do this. By the way, that kid right there, he's here this week. Uh, again, showing the four flight in here. Those 2 a.m. shifts, those are brutal. Gotta stay with it. <laughs> but these kids love it. 
Actually, last year, we actually had Brittany Machalka here from Redbird. We invited her to come in and to be part of one of the teams. So she participated with us, with us and they actually used uh, that for part of the episode that they did for Winging It here in Oshkosh. And it was really kind of cool uh, with, with them. Aero Build, this is the engineering side of the house. Uh, I realize I'm running out of time here, guys. I apologize. This is kind of how we do things here. Building engineers, one airplane at a time. Uh, it's all about the same thing that we do. This airplane stays with the program so that the kids get the ongoing maintenance on this airplane under my repairman certificate. That's what we're building. Velocity XL RG, that's what we're building. Here's where it starts. We start in elementary here with paper airplanes. Second grade, we're into this. Third grade, we build these. Middle school, UAVs. High school, that's what we build. That's the progression. We have these kiddos in here, and I mean, they are awesome. In addition to building those airplanes, at the end, they have to make a verbal presentation. They do a history report on the aircraft that they built, and they have to do it orally in front of a live audience and live cameras. We live stream it. This is where we start these kids verbalizing. My high school kids act as mentors. It's not an option. It's an expectation. That's part of that. That's part of that giving back. That's how they honor us in this program is by doing the deal. This is where it, this is where it is. Fastest growing segment of aviation today. This is what these kiddos are doing. We got to feed it. Then here we go. Out here doing the deal, wiping the schmooey on the wings there. That velocity. This is them working the canard. This little guy right here never held a power tool in his life. I walked out there one morning, he's got a skill saw cutting the knack events in the back of that velocity. My heart just stopped. I'm going, oh my God, Spencer, please. He gets done with that. He was, he turned around to me. He saw me standing there and he was so proud. Mr. R, Mr. R, look what I did. I said, I can see you cut a hole in my airplane. He's going, no, you know, and so it was awesome. So here he is doing the Clecos. These are the kids doing some problem solving. All right, how do we protect that hydraulic line going to the brakes? How do we do it? They came up with the solution. It's their airplane. It's theirs. This airplane will be in Oshkosh here next year. Educator Network, this is that piece that allows us to share what we do. This is that part that we can plug into school districts. This is the full Monty. The classes that I teach are live streamed. I can teach these classes from Mars. I teach them from the various schools that participate in our program. Because again, you have kind of the canned component, but you've got the live component. I go to these schools to also work with the educators, work with the administrators, to be able to, to guide them, to kind of manage, if you will, sort of the success of what they're doing and the direction that they're doing it. Access to our College and University Alliance. What that means is this. We now have an agreement with Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University and Prescott. Here's what this, this agreement is. We have a kid that graduates our program as a multi-engine commercial pilot. They go to Embry-Riddle. In their freshman year at Embry-Riddle, Embry-Riddle will put them through a five-month program to become a CFI. At the end of that CFI program, if the student's happy and if the university's happy, they're going to slide a piece of paper over in front of that kid that says, if you agree to stay with us and to teach on our flight line, we're going to pay you to teach. We're going to give you 401k. We're going to give you health insurance. We're going to give you room and board. And we're also going to waive your tuition for your sophomore, junior, senior year, and a master's degree if you want it. That's over $180,000. People say, how do, how do people afford this? To get a private pilot certificate through our program costs about eight grand. Instrument, about eight grand. Commercial, about eight grand. So here we are, 32. I'm gonna write you a check for 180 over here. Everybody's got skin in the game. I give nothing away. You earn it. But what we do is we go out and we make those relationships. We create those alliances to help us to continue those pathways for what we want. So that's part of the things that we have. 
I take these kids all over the place. Here we are at Flight Safety International in Columbus. Fabio Miguez was great to us. The folks at Goodyear were awesome. The videos that these kids create go on the Aero Educator Network website. All of the students that are in the program have access to those videos, to those interviews, to the classes, and to the incentives that we have. But you've got to be part of that network to do it. That's how I can guarantee the outcomes. Ohio State University, oh, I'm sorry, THE Ohio State University. Dr. Stacy Weislogel, an icon in aviation there. Here we are at our good friends at NetJets. General McGee, kind enough to spend some time with us. Here we are at one of the museums there in Ohio. Here we are in Florida, Daytona Beach, Aspen, Florida, Ohio, Dayton, Ohio. I'll be doggone. Some little bike shop. A couple of brothers doing the deal. Sean D. Tucker. This is my personal favorite. <laughs> I actually got to meet Bert Rutan last year. He was a, he's been a, just a hero of mine forever. Finally got to meet him. And finally we got to the point where he's like, you do what? <laughs> but anyway, guys, that's, that's the big deal. The end of this rainbow, if it doesn't have some form of, of industry certification at the end of it, what are we doing? Better grades. Kids get high school and college credit. We look for incentives for those higher learning needs. Careers in fields that our nation needs. Life skills. The two feet principle. Got to learn to get up on them. Got to learn to stand on them. Also, even if a student in their junior year says to me, you know, Mr. R, this has been awesome, but I think I'm going to follow my heart into art history. God bless. At least I know that we have an art historian who is going to have a higher level of technological literacy and a better understanding of the world around them. We need those two. Building Americans, as opposed to Americans. Well, I can't do this. I can't do it. The only reason you're saying that is because you've decided not to. Henry Ford said, whether you think you're right or whether you think you're wrong, either way, you're probably right. So there it is. What do you got? So guys, that's kind of what we do. Uh, goodness, I kind of went long. Sorry. <laughs> um, oh, here, let me, let me do this. Uh, oh, here, guys, I'm sorry. I've got something for you. Um, guys, if, if you're like me, and I know I am, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know there's nothing like a good toolbox. And as you can clearly see, this is nothing like a good toolbox. But what I've got, <laughs> I'm just a big idiot. Um, I've got some brochures here for you guys. So if this is something, it's got my contact information on it. If there's some big questions, guys, that I can answer for you, something I can, I can do for you, um, Please let me know. My email is on the back there with that. That's probably a better way to kind of get a hold of me, just email-wise, uh, because I'm kind of out there, back there with that. Ma'am, you, you get reading matter, late night, nightstand, great stuff. Okay. Uh, here you go. There you go. So just let me know how, you know, what we can do, how I can help and stuff. And what this is is kind of here's what we kind of think is possible. Do I think that every school district is going to say, yep, let me have the full Monty? There's a lot to digest here. Starting this spring, we will have the ability to have modules so that if a, if a, if a school wants to start with just a class, we can do that. But they have to commit to the program. And the reason being is just like commitment, perseverance, respect, and honor is the backbone of this, is because this. If a kid wanted to take a class, you can take a class. You can take class anywhere. People have been offering classes everywhere. But we're still not getting what we need. Why not? We don't have the pathway. I am all about the program. It's about the program, not the class. It's about the student, the school, and the community. That's what I'm interested in building. Anybody can do just a class. But if that's what it takes to get your feet wet, if that's what it takes to get started, God bless, but we've got to commit to more. That's what I'm after. And I, I don't mean to sound like a hard butt on that, but that's, it's just important. We've seen the other stuff come and go. 
I've been doing this for eight years now. Wow. Wow. Man, I'm old. Anyway, guys, there you go. Sorry. All right. Oh, oh, an applause. Thank you. <laughs>